Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for Market Mind Games, the new psychology of risk. I'm Betty Smith. I'm Vice President of Communications here at CQG. And today it's my pleasure to welcome Denise Schull. As always, before we get started with today's webinar, we have a little bit of housekeeping. So if you have any technical problems during the course of the webinar, uh, please use the chat feature in the middle of the right-hand side of the screen, and you can send a message, and our host will try to resolve that quickly for you. Uh, as you have questions during the presentation today, uh, please submit them using the Q&A feature, which is down in the lower right-hand corner, and we will try to answer as many questions as possible uh, at the end of the presentation. If we don't get to all of the questions today, uh, Denise or someone here at CQG will get back to you promptly after the webinar. So with that, I would love to introduce Denise. I've had the opportunity to interview her and her approach uh, to risk, behaviors, and the markets uh, I find to be just a fascinating niche, and it's based on very solid research and practice, which Denise is going to talk to us about today. Uh, Denise is the founder of the Rethink Group, and she traded upstairs at the SIBO with former floor traders. She's a thought leader in the psychology of risk, uncertainty, and exceptional performance, which I'm sure everyone is interested in knowing more about. And her first book, Market Mind Games, uh, will be released this fall. So with that, I'm going to pass the presentation over to Denise. Thanks for joining us. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? We can hear you. I hear a little bit of background noise, Denise, but I, I think we'll be fine. Okay. It might be the air conditioner, which I'm not sure I can live without. Um, but I will try this. Is this is this better? Is it a little clearer, that, everyone? That sounds clearer. Thank you. Okay. All right. So I glanced through the attendee list, and I, I recognize a fair number of names, but I, my guess is... There's also a fair number of you that haven't heard me speak before. And if I could just get you to tell me in the Q&A box if this is the first time you're hearing me talk about my view on the mind game of markets or the mind game of trading, that would be a little bit helpful. Okay. That's not... Uh, that's not too bad. So, well, first of all, it's a completely different perspective on how your brain perceives uncertainty and how you make market decisions and how you make trading decisions. So, like, I can't say that enough times, that this is based on lots of neuroscience uh, stitched together from different fields of neuroscience, as well as my own trading experience and now my trading experience or mental coaching experience with traders that run the gamut from retail guys trading their own account with ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars to hedge fund discretionary traders managing a billion and a half dollars and just about every variety in between. So I haven't got that many slides. I'm gonna to try to give you like the big picture overview and then and a couple of important points that you can take away and then take Q&A. So the traditional mind game is certainly understand the probabilities, control your emotions, plan the trade, trade the plan. And actually, unfortunately, they're probably all um, at a minimum inadequate and at a maximum actually wrong and hurt you. And um, there's a couple of reasons why, and hopefully we'll get into them. Uh, the accurate mind game is that you, first of all, and actually the problem I think you all is that I seem to have a frog, a frog in my throat. So give me a second here and let me um, try to clear my throat so you don't have to listen to this scratchy voice. And this is Betty. I just want to let all of you, you know that, yes, this webinar will be recorded, as always, and available on our news site, news.cqg.com. Okay, I'm back. Hopefully that will work. So the accurate mind game is, first of all, 
yes, probabilities are interesting and they're good to know, but the fact of the matter is, is you're dealing with relentless uncertainty and you have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. You only have, at best, an approximation of the idea. Now, this matters a whole lot because that's the way your brain recognizes the markets. It's not something that I'm telling you philosophically, although philosophically it's true. I mean, no one knows what's going to happen tomorrow, and probabilities are only based on what's happened in the past. But, but your brain literally recognizes the markets much more like being in the jungle than solving an algebra problem or geometry problem or an engineering problem. So since your brain recognizes that you're in the jungle and you're not doing algebra or geometry, it actually reacts differently to that. And what you should always remember is that it's going to demand of you that you make judgment calls. Yes, you can have a plan, but you your brain literally cannot trade that plan exactly as you've planned it. It's going to demand you make a judgment call because it perceives you to be at risk and wanting you to take in all of the relevant clues of the risk in the moment and asking you to make a judgment call just like you were in the jungle. So it uses emotions as data. It actually uses emotions as data in a whole lot of forms um, just to give you an example, the latest research shows that your visual cortex or your eyesight, your eyes, literally, if they're not infused with emotional data, that they will not be able to identify anything. They won't work. That's come from research where people had lost their eyesight and then had been restored through surgery. And while people could see objects, they couldn't tell what they were, and it took a lot of time uh, and presumably the development of meaning, which is communicated through emotion, both consciously and unconsciously, in order for the eyes to be able to work. Now, the practical application of that for you all as market professionals is changing your perspective on emotion from something that you're supposed to control, avoid, set aside, get over, to data. And looking at it, rethinking of emotion as data, because that's the way the brain's using it, and first of all, that's all it really is, i.e., an emotion alone never made or lost a dime. It's only the action or the acting out of an emotion that can make or lose money. So it's the actions that need controlled, not the emotions. And the more you start to look at the emotions as data and understand the emotions as data, first it's going to help you dramatically in your risk management and ultimately will help you learn to do bullet point number three, which is surfing this waves of human perception, which is what you're really trying to do. Most trading education will tell you that you're supposed to understand the probabilities and then trade the probabilities. Well, what you're really trying to do is trade other people's future perception. In other words, if you sell it now at 1 o'clock in the afternoon on July 27th, you want to make sure that other people are going to be selling it later at a lower price. That's always what you're betting on. But most of us don't look at the market as a predicting other people game. When you do look at the market at a predicting other pe as a predicting other people game, you're actually looking at it as more what it is, which helps you to understand it more accurately, and you're getting in sync with the way your brain looks at it. There's research that shows that the more you use the parts of your brain that are related to predicting other people, the better you are at reading markets. And so therefore, the more you've learned to use your own emotions as data, the more you're able to see where other people are acting out their emotions, not using them as data. Hopefully that makes sense. So let's just get through to the next slide here. When your brain perceives a risk, basically, and I've talked about this in the, in, in, already, and I, I have a tendency to do that, uh, already talk about my next slide, but just to reiterate in a different way, when your brain perceives risk and that you need to make a decision about risk, its response is to start looking through its pattern recognition. Start looking through unconscious patterns that are stored as to say, what does this match? What is this similar to? And then once it finds a pattern that it's similar to, make a judgment call about it. The point being, 
your brain is actually going to compel you to act based on the emotional meaning of something. That's what's really happening. Your brain is compelling you to act based on the emotional meaning. So if you're trying to set the emotional meaning aside and override it with your intellect, you're actually not going to win. You may win in the short term, but inevitably the brain is going to win. The brain's design is going to win out. It's why plan the trade, trade the plan doesn't completely work. Yes, you should have a plan. Yes, you should plan the trade. But in trade the plan, you have to leave a big gap for judgment calls. Because when you leave that big gap for judgment calls, you're actually working in concert with your brain, i.e., the emotions required in any decision, for example, particularly market decisions, first of all, are just the confidence factor. Confidence factor goes from panic on one end to overconfidence on the other. You can't, and you never do, you never have ever in your life, despite what you think, made a decision without a confidence factor because the neuroscience research is completely unassailable at this point that it's not possible without an emotion to make a decision. And if it's not possible to make a decision without an emotion, that means every, defi every decision by definition has an emotion involved in it. So the clue is to start working with that stuff consciously as data as opposed to trying to set aside this large data set that your brain is using anyway. So just to kind of talk about feelings and emotions as data, and for all practical purposes, I, I kind of use feelings and emotions as synonymous. They're not completely, but when I'm talking like this, you can sort of consider them somewhat synonymous. But let's just start with physical feelings that you feel in your body. It, you can learn to use them as a risk management tool. The idea is eventually when you start to work with feelings and emotions as data in a systematic, organized way, because you can do that even though it's not numbers and it's hard to put in a spreadsheet, although I have had clients that have put all of their feelings, tracked all of their feelings and emotions to the point that they get them in spreadsheets and they, they know themselves so well that they can say, look, it's that cell right there that I'm in right now. But the idea is that eventually through working with this data set, you're able to tell the difference between an intuitive, intuitive being experiential learning or unconscious pattern recognition feeling, which is communicated in your psyche, communicated via your body, and an impulsive feeling, which is about an emotion that you're not fully aware of, that you don't really know what it's about, and it's compelling you to act. So ultimately where I ask everybody to think of the end game here is knowing the difference between unconscious pattern recognition, how that feels in your body, and how impulse feels in your body. That's the end point. Attitude feelings, sort of expectations, um, mood, uh, irritability, things that come, like, for example, from being tired, can also be a huge risk management tool. Like, for example, research shows trait Perceiving risk at all, when you're tired, you'll misperceive the risk. You'll misjudge the distance between you and the next car. You'll mis misjudge distance. You'll misjudge all sorts of things. You will certainly misjudge what you actually see on the screen. So a very simple feelings and emotions as data used as risk management is to work into your trading plan to get enough sleep. And one of you that I happen to know is listening to me because I did, I did uh, look through the attendee list earlier sent me an article the other day about basketball players in 10 hours of sleep uh, and, and the need or the, the benefit of that. We'll talk about this again at the end, but if you think about it, what I'm starting to say is not unlike trading is like being a professional athlete, and you need to manage the whole of yourself, you know, mind and body, in order to be able to work with these feelings. and First of all, be able to put yourself in a feeling, emotional, psychological state such that you can make an optimal judgment call, 
but also so that you can be aware when you're not in that state and choose to manage your risk by not trading when you're not in that state. Now, if you're trading a probabilistic system and you're supposed to be taking every trade, then you think, wait a minute, I'm supposed to be in front of the market because if I'm not, I'm not taking every trade and my probabilities aren't working. But if you're not psychologically able to make your best judgment call, you've affected what those probabilities are because you are the executor. So when you affect what the probabilities are, it changes the whole game. The game was about you and what's in your head and executing as best as you can out of out of your psyche as opposed to what the historical probabilities numbers say the market behaved in the past. So having said that, because we don't have a lot of time today, there are some specific emotions that I want to talk about and then get into Q&A. For purposes of our conversation today, I'm just going to call them the sort of superficial emotions, the ones you're all going to recognize, and then this level of unconscious, which is also a level that can have a huge impact on your risk management. And in this realm, particularly in the realm of a confidence, confidence factor, that well, there's really four emotions on here. But the green is sort of the superficial or what you can know, you tend to know that you're feeling, the fear of losing or the fear of being wrong. And um, that's what you know, you tend to know that you experience in the moment. What tends to drive those two relatively superficial feelings is the fear of missing out or fear, the fear of not being good enough. And this is where it gets into what's going on that's typically not conscious for you, um, but is having a huge impact on how intense that more superficial feeling is. And so you're really f feeling this, this fear of being wrong, or you're really fearing this fear of losing, and it, it's very intense, and you're compelled to act. You're trying to set aside the feeling. Sooner or later, you act on it. Of course, you always act on it at the worst possible moment. You weren't able to untangle that sequence of events because you didn't really understand that the driver, the intensity of that superficial feeling was coming from the deeper, more unconscious feeling that you can make conscious. Okay. So, again, we've got... It, on the surface, this fear of losing, fear of being wrong, which is kind of a cognitive feeling, and I, I intend to put that there in a, a red spectrum, is that's kind of your signal to say, hmm, hmm, I'm feeling the fear of losing or the fear of being wrong. What is that really about? Well, it's really about this fractal of a feeling. And I'm just curious, um, can you all let me know how many of you are familiar with fractal geometry? I don't know what the delay is here. Denise, do you want people to use the Q&A feature? Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. So I presume some of you are familiar with fractal geometry since I'm actually not getting. Oh, there we go. There's the chat. I'm sorry, I'm looking in the wrong box. Before we was in the Q&A. <laughs> so let, let me look back here for just a second because I was looking down below under Q&A. Okay, so there, a few of you are familiar with fractal geometry. Well, I submit to you that your psyches are fractal. And for those of you who aren't familiar with fractal geometry, it's a body of work that shows that many patterns in nature have... Uh, small elements, if you will, that repeat many times in many ways and create larger elements. Um, the term that's used in practical geometry is self-similar, but the, a practical example is both broccoli and cauliflower, as well as your lungs, tree branches. But broccoli and cauliflower are sort of the easiest to understand. So you look at a whole head of broccoli and it looks one way. You look at one stalk of broccoli, actually, and think about it, it looks just like the whole head. It's just smaller. You pull out one stem, and it still looks basically exactly the same. It's just smaller even yet. And so that smallest stem of broccoli would be the simplest fractal. 
when it multiplies and repeats upon itself enough times, it creates the whole head of broccoli. Well, I submit to you that your self-perception, what you expect of yourself, what you expect of others, how you expect authority to treat you, what you expect to be able to get, all exist essentially in a fractal pattern within your brain. Now, I'm not saying that that's a proven thing, that someone can show you the neurons that are a fractal. I mean, the brain science is nowhere near that. But the concept of fractals and self-similar repetition such that you create large objects from small patterns that are repeated many times matches the Freudian idea of transferences essentially perfectly in, from my point of view. And as it turned out, I'm finding out that there are a few other people actually in the world that have been saying this in the last decade or so. And I only knew of one of them yesterday. I found out that there are a number of academic papers, maybe a dozen or so, that um, basically say the same thing, that the psyche is essentially fractal. Now, why this matters is because this is ultimately where you want to get, that you understand what those unconscious fractals are of your self-perception and expectation that drive your fear of being wrong, fear of not being good enough, fear of m missing out, although fear of missing out tends to be much more superficial. It's really that fear of not being good enough, fear of being wrong, fear of not being smart enough that imbue those more superficial feelings with a lot of power. And as you get more self-aware about your own fractal psychology, if you will, your own fractal setup, you can know when the intensity of what you're feeling is being driven by your history as opposed to being driven by the market or as opposed to being driven by what happened. And when you know it, you're able to verbalize it, put it into words, and in doing so, actually dissipate some of its power. And when you dissipate some of its power, you're less compelled to act on it. Now, remember, your, your brain is pushing you to make judgment calls, make intuitive actions, if you will, act out of your intuition because it recognizes that it's in uncertainty. So this process is going on all the time. Because it's 2011 and you all have been taught either the formal or the popular version of cognitive behavioral psychology, you've been told to use your intellect to overcome all this. Well, your intellect isn't going to be able to overcome all of this. Otherwise, trade the plan, plan the trade, plan the trade, plan the trade, trade the plan, excuse me, would be relatively easy. You'd all be doing it and no one would come to any trading psychology webinars because it really wouldn't be that hard. But as I know you all know, it's a lot uh, harder, let's see, what's it, how do I want to put this? It's a lot easier said than done to use, to use a, uh, a common phrase. And the reason why is essentially this fundamental misunderstanding of how the brain perceives and acts in uncertainty, how it uses emotions as data, and how there are these two levels of emotion, the stronger of which is one that's fractal, that's in your psyche, that needs to become conscious for you not to just act it out. And in doing so, whatever level of consciousness that you can create about emotion, your own emotions, i.e. the emotions as data, then you're able to use those as risk management signals, whether that means get away from the screen, whether that means get some sleep, whether that means that you get to the point and say, hmm, I do know, I recognize this feeling, this physical experience as valid intuition, as valid experiential learning because I've watched the screens for 10 or 20 or 30 years now. And this feeling that I'm feeling is, it's accurate. It is reading the other people. This is, I wasn't going to talk about this, but there is a, a parts of your brain that are set up to read other people through symbols. There's parts of your brain set up to read other people when you can see them and you can see their physical body moving, like I'm talking with my hands even though you can't see me. But there's parts of your brain that are set up to read other people through symbols. Obviously, that's the part of your brain you want to be using when you're making market decisions. Those parts of your brain are going to communicate 
to you much more through the feeling and emotional dimension than through the intellectual dimension. That's why you've got to start thinking about how to use them as data. So here's a specific example. Transference to the market. I know we only have limited time, so I usually have longer to talk than I do today. So um, I'm not necessarily managing my time as well as I could. But um, just to go back for a second, my master's degree is in neuropsychoanalysis from the University of Chicago, and that's what I was doing before I started trading. So I started trading, and then I had some thoughts about emotions as data and traders using emotions that matched up with the research about how humans make decisions and how you have to have emotion. And I was like, gosh, all the trading psychology tells you not to have any emotion. How can you not have any emotion when you have to have emotion to make a decision? Like, this is just illogical. Plus, you really only have to – it's all how you act, not how you feel that make the difference. So even though – that's all I really wanted to do originally was get that message out there related to the relatively superficial emotions. What happened was I started working with clients, and I started finding out that everybody looked at the market understandably as an authority figure and reacted to price action and trades that work or trades that don't work with, that, with the voice of that old fractal. And, for example, one early client couldn't figure out why when he got stopped out, even though it was a stop he planned, that he just, basically got enraged. It was in his plan, but he became enraged, and repeatedly, you know, over a long period of time. He finally figured out that it made him feel like when he was in fifth, when he was actually first or second grade, I was going to say fifth grade, um, he'd been on the playground, some other kids had gotten a fight, they drugged them all in, he wasn't in the fight, and they were not allowed, he wasn't allowed to go back out for recess, and I think he was punished and allowed to go back out for recess for a week. And his feeling was, I did nothing wrong, and I was deprived of re recess, where it's exactly the same way he felt when he got stopped out, that he made this plan, it seemed like it would work, he got stopped out, he did nothing wrong, but he lost money, and it was tapping into that feeling. Um, one that I've heard over and over and over and over and over from so many traders in the past five years is how losing and trading and the fear of being wrong taps into, you know, sort of, you bring home an A minus and somebody says, why didn't you get an A? Or you play a good basketball game and someone says, you know, why didn't you shoot 20 points or why did you miss that free throw? And that the market brings that stuff back. And I was actually talking to the chief operating officer of one of the top 15 hedge funds in the world yesterday, and he took the words right out of my mouth. He said, well, of course. It's a tick-by-tick -tick assault on your ego. And it is. You sit there, you're looking for the trade, you think, that you're not supposed to be caring about whether you win or lose, but how can you not? In what other realm in the whole entire world does does anyone have to sit and stare at something that constantly says yes or no, good or bad, smart or dumb, rich or poor? No one has to do that, except when you sit in front of the markets. And you can try all day long to detach yourself from that completely, but you're not going to be able to do it. You're not going to be able to do it because of the way emotions are supposed to play a role in, in decisions, in teaching us stuff, in communicating meaning, in turning our attention to where it needs to be, you're not going to be able to do it basically because of the way the brain is designed. So my argument is, you know, like just start working. If we start working with the way the brain is designed, trading will get a lot easier, frankly. Okay, I think I've got maybe... Um, one or two more slides, and then we'll be Q&A. So to take a step back from the rather intense sort of Freudian transference fractal repetition, the, the way you start to work with this is to think in terms of creating psychological leverage. I used to call it psychological capital. I still think it's psychological capital, but people seem to relate to the idea of psychological leverage a little bit better. Um, and Plan your whole trading life around what is your psychological capital. Always be checking what is your psychological capital. And then be planning such that you can increase the leverage of your psychological capital by not trading when you're tired, not trading when you've had a fight, by the way, with your wife, husband, teenager, mother, father, sister, dog, boss, whatever. Like if you – here's an example I know you all relate to. You've had some sort of argument with someone – and, of course, they don't agree with your perspective or else she wouldn't have had the argument, right? 
and you get to your desk and you start trading and you take some trades, but afterwards you're like, what the heck? What was I thinking? Why did I do that? Well, what happens is having the argument makes you feel out of control because the person that can't see your perspective isn't listening to you. You can't understand why they can't see your perspective. So you know you want so badly for them to see your perspective. They can't. You feel out of control. But when you get in front of the screen, guess what? you can all of a sudden feel in control because you can take a trade and you can put a position in your account or you can take a position out of your account and you actually are in control. Never mind whether the trade's going to work or not. I mean, it, lo- it always looks like it's going to work, right? But it's not. It's not about that. What's happening is you're really wanting to feel in control. Now, if you're managing the psychological capital and creating psychological leverage, you say, I'm irritated, annoyed, angry, infuriated, whatever level of... Uh, you know, annoyance this this theoretical fight is created for you and say, I don't want to be trading now because I'm going to be taking too much risk. I'm going to be acting out this feeling of wanting to be in control in my trades. It's going to not only hurt my actual cash capital and P&L, but it's going to hurt my psychological capital, and it's certainly going to deprive me. I don't have any psychological leverage now. I'm totally, I'm totally debit it out on psychological leverage when I'm irritated. And I don't have all that much psychological capital. If you start to create your trading plan around that concept and then manage yourself to that concept and then leave room in your trading plan for judgment and start to use your feelings, learn to understand, analyze in a systematic way your feelings and emotions as data, you're going to end up with a better result, not only at the end of the month, but at the end of the year. So um, I'm sure this is – I'm at least 99.8% sure this is my last slide. Think of trading like a team sport, and you really are your whole team. You're playing offense and defense. You're managing your risk, obviously, defense. You're playing offense in a strategic way when you're looking at what works in the market, when you're working on trying to read other people. And treat the whole endeavor like an athlete would treat it in terms of physical preparation, mental preparation, and then reading the offense and defense, having a game plan, but adjusting. And with that, since I was only given 30 minutes, no problem with only being given 30 minutes, um, let's do some Q&A because that's a high-level overview of a, actually a lot of material. Denise, it's Betty. I'm impressed that you got through all of that in <sighs> Less than 30 minutes, uh-huh. and uh, I could see from the Q&A in the chat that people were really engaged, and we do have some really good questions, so okay. uh, we'll jump right into that. So our first question was from Dorothy, and she asked if you can talk to the fear of pulling the trigger, especially for newbies. Um, fear, well, okay, fear of pulling the trigger usually, if you don't say newbies, is about perfectionism and wanting to please someone and wanting to do things just right. But if you're brand new, I mean, like someone calls me up and they've been trading five, ten years and they have a fear of pulling the trigger, I always know, I always know immediately that there was someone in their life that they couldn't please and they're trying to be perfect. But if you're brand new, I mean, it's like anything else, you know, you do have to have some experience with it. So, you know, it's sort of, fair, you know, it's scary to go skiing for the first time is scary to jump out of a plane maybe forever you know it's always scary to do stuff um early on but what you, what you do with that is instead of trying to talk yourself out of the fear you say i'm really afraid of making a mistake i'm really afraid of losing money i'm really afraid of being wrong i'm af- whatever comes after you know i'm afraid of pulling the trigger but then you're going to see there's going to be a feeling behind it just verbalize it Put it into words, and what you'll likely find is that the fear dissipates enough that you're able to pull the trigger. And that's actually always the case. If you put the feelings into words, what they really are, you'll find that they tend to go away. All right, and the next question is from John, and he says, very interesting concepts. Will you discuss focus and concentration relative to these ideas? And the follow-up is, do emotions tend to dull your focus and concentration? (laughs) That's actually an excellent, excellent question. Um, I think there's probably, but having said that, it is an excellent question. I sort of think there's probably too much emphasis put on focus and concentration, and this is the reason why. 
research shows that complex decisions are best made in a non-deliberate fashion. Now, that's a shocking statement, particularly to a trader or someone who stares at a screen. Because you want to go, okay, factor A, B, C, D, E, and F fit together. I'm in, or A, B, C, D, and E are happening, and I'm out. And you want to make that decision in a serial, linear fashion because that's what you were taught to do, except that the research really shows that a complex decision is best made non-deliberately. So the truth is, generally, I mean, unless you're talking that you can't focus at all, um, the truth is generally less a little less focus probably can help you trade better, i.e., you look at the market, you walk away, you think about what you're seeing, you listen to those feelings and emotions as data, and you say, you know, do I feel like I'm seeing a pattern that I recognize, or am I feeling, you know, compelled because I'm tired, angry, annoyed, upset that I lost at the last trade, afraid I'm going to miss out? Oh, by the way, I didn't make this clear. Fear of missing out or fear of regret in the future is the most powerful feeling. So you can always expect to be have the fear of missing out. Now, if you can walk away, you can say to yourself, am I feeling the fear of missing out? And is, fear, is this fear of missing out really relevant to whether I want to take this trade or not? So, I mean, obviously, John, I can't have this conversation with you, so I, you know, I have to read into that question a little bit, but in general, I'm going to say that maybe less focus and less concentration can actually be helpful back to the complex decisions are best made non-deliberately research. Thanks, Denise. Uh, I have a question from Peter. Uh, He says he'd love to hear specific techniques, perhaps you've listed them, for gaining perspective on emotions so that they become data rather than rogue waves. Rather than what was the end of that? Rather than rogue waves. Well, it's a process of learning to listen to yourself. So, I mean, the first thing you have to do is decide that it's valid, right? And and, and frankly, deciding that what I just said is valid is going to be tough because cognitive behavioral, you know, approach to life has been the overarching approach in psychology and every other discipline and everything we all learned in school for our entire lives. And it's not, even though the research that you have to have a motion to make a decision is well known among researchers and has been so for 15 years, it's not well known among the general population. So first of all, you have to believe it. And, And by the way, Harry Markowitz's Modern Portfolio Theory, the beginning of quantitative trading, he said your beliefs are step one, and this this paper starts with stage two. But if you start to believe it, then you say, how do I track what I'm feeling? And like I said, I've had, I mean, the easiest way I find is is just to get OneNote, Microsoft OneNote, write it down, create no flags, and then go back at the end of the week so that you can sort of see a chart of yourself, of your ways of feeling. But, you know, I've had a lot of clients who create spreadsheets um, and list feelings and then check them off. There's also a process of learning to do it through athletics and outside of trading or when you're on the highway to just basically constantly be sort of saying, what am I feeling where am I feeling in my body just because that kind of helps give you a different perspective and what is it what's really causing it as opposed to saying don't feel like that set that feeling aside to embrace the, the process is one of embracing it looking at it you know think of it like looking at a piece of art or you know a crystal or a seashell something that you pick up and you kind of examine that you treat your feelings and emotions like that, so that you're researching them at first, so you start to get familiar with them and even know that you're having them. Now, you can always verbalize them. Written is better, but just saying them out loud to help you avoid acting on them while you're going through this transition. And you're not just going to be able I mean, I have had people call up and say, you know, you told me to start verbalizing my fear, I started verbalizing my fear, I was able to pull the trigger and it's six months later and my p and way improved. But, you know, it's, depending on where you are and how you've dealt with feelings and emotions in the past, not necessarily that easy. 
Um, but it, it, at the end, it's paying attention to yourself and being willing to feel something. Like we kind of think that if you feel a feeling, you know, you're sort of like something bad's going to happen. And what you find is there's almost no feeling that you can feel like nothing bad happens. Like it feels bad in your gut or whatever, but nothing bad happens. Like you can just have the feeling and and a, a bad thing doesn't happen. We don't know that until we sort of practice with it. So hopefully that helps a little bit, Peter. It's easier when I can kind of go back and forth. <laughs> Sure. Thanks, Denise. Um, this question may go back to what you were saying about focus and concentration. It's um, from Randolph, and he asked, do you think getting away from the screen is the answer for some of us control freaks? I think getting away, I think everybody should get away from the screen on a regular basis. Like, like just just like offense and defense in a, in a game. I mean, you want to you want to rest your psyche, your brain constantly. I think it should be part, absolutely part of your trading plan. Put the trade on and walk away. Get out of it and walk away. But I think walking, walking away is as big of an advantage as staying there. It's bigger. No, no, no. I take that back. It's definitely bigger. Everyone feels like they have to stay there, but somehow the world's next, next great trade or next great trend is going to start right now, and if they walk away, you're going to miss it. And if you learn to walk away on a regular basis, you're going to do better. Plus, you can walk away and still think about it, i.e., you're getting a cup of coffee, you're walking around the block, whatever. You're letting your brain make a complex decision non-deliberately. So I would use walking away very systematically. I recommend walk, using it very systematically. All right. Denise, we have so many good questions, um, and people are <laughs> hanging in there with us. You've got over 200 participants today, so I think we'll take a few more questions, and you can let me know when you're ready to wrap. Okay. Uh, this question's from Darren. Uh, how do you deal with trading your system and then getting stopped out and feeling like a loser? <laughs> how do you deal with trading your system, getting stopped out, and feeling like a loser? Well, we figure out where that real – what's the real – history behind that feeling like a loser and once we figure out what the real history is you can it's much easier to say okay i was made to feel like a loser by so and so when such and such happened and that's in me in in my fractal psychology but it doesn't have anything to do with the here and now but unless you can get back to the the root or at least if not the very root, root, root of it, at least uh, halfway to the root, like, you know, something that happened in high school or college, and say, that, you know, this I'm feeling so intensely like a loser, but you know what? It's really tapping into, it's really tapping into something, some memory that I have, um, and that feeling was, it, the intensity of this feeling is about that, not about this trade that I just lost. And once, and once you can assign the intensity to something in the past, it, it takes it away from the moment, frankly. All right. Uh, we've got a question from TJ. How do you regain e-capital, and I'm assuming that's emotional capital or psychological capital, after a big loss? You mourn. You get upset. You 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 let yourself feel lousy. You you know <laughs> mope around. However long it takes, write about it. You go through the mourning process. You feel bad. Let yourself feel mad at yourself. Let yourself feel bad about losing the money. Just let yourself feel lousy. Put it into words as much as you can, and it will go away sooner. If you don't. You know, you know what happens. You actually create more losers. I don't even need to go there. Um, by the way, that works on both sides of the equation. You big loser, feel lousy. Just lean into it, feel it. You know, go for a bike ride. And I don't care if it takes five minutes or if it takes five years. You know, because you're gonna you're not gonna make money when you feel like that. And so it's, it's sort of like feel a feeling, let it burn itself out, and then you'll be able to get on with it. And like I said before, it, you won't actually self-destruct when you let yourself feel bad, even though it sort of seems like you will. 
I wish you could see my face. I'm, like, grimacing because I know it's not the easiest thing to do. All right. Uh, I have a question from Kelly. What sort of past experiences, outcomes, or consequences in a person's life could provide reliable clues about a person's key deficits or suitability for being a successful trader? <laughs> um, that's a very interesting and very large question, Kelly. Um, but I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut to the chase of it. Uh, this research that shows that people who are better at using what's called theory of mind, which is theory of mind means you have a theory of the other person's mind, um, are better at reading markets, is, I think, astounding research and explains why some people are naturally good traders. And so I'm going to skip to the end of the question because I can't go through all, you know, sort of all the deficits, but say work on, consciously work on theory of mind, reading other people. Because we all have the ability to do it. You can't walk down a street in New York City or drive down a highway in any other city in the United States without reading what other people are going to do or else, you know, you're running into them. So it's a natural ability everyone has so you can develop it. And then you're... By the way, anybody wants to go look up the research on that, it's called Exploring the Nature of Trader Intuition. And the lead author on it is Brugier, B-R-U-G-U-I-E-R. It's a very complex study. It's done as an electrical engineering dissertation at Caltech. Yes, he wanted to know what makes traders tick. <laughs> um, but... Working on your skills of reading other people through the screen, through the screen, and not looking at it as lines and bars crossing, but the price action is other people. The better you get at that, the better you're going to get at, at being a trader. Bottom line. And, and Kelly, if we, you know, if I could talk to you or see you, we could maybe go into some of the other parts of that question. All right, Denise. Uh, we have so many great questions. I think we'll take two more, okay. uh, and then I'll give you a chance to talk about your your upcoming book and also your website. As we've had several people uh, ask where they can learn more about your work. Okay. So uh, the next question from Rob: Can you expand on defense as it applies to preparation? Can I explain, expand on defense as it applies to preparation? I hate to be so pedantic, but I'm going to go back to sleep, sleep and exercise and how you feel physically. I mean, that's your best, you know, if you set yourself up to be physically energetic, or only be trading when you're physically energetic and it, when you're not, then fix that problem. Like, like an athlete with a twisted ankle fixes the twisted ankle before they go back to the basketball court. Um, that's going to take care of so much on the defense side and set you up then to play good offense. I know it sounds mundane, like, you know, I, yes, this is your mother speaking, get enough sleep, eat your vegetables and exercise, but it's really true. Trading is, a, trading is an athletic endeavor, and the better you feel physically, the better that, that mind-body perceptual mechanism is going to work, and that's what you're trying to create. The, uh, the accurate mind-body perceptual mechanism of other people, and a big portion of that is the feelings and emotions, both feelings of physical energy and emotional feelings of meaning. That's how you actually differentiate between those two. But Anyway, so I guess we'll do one more. This is the very last question. It's from Thomas. What is your experience in getting traders uh, to change their trading behavior, and how long does it take? <laughs> Well, that's a great question, um, and it's all over the board. Um, I Honestly, I've had people who attend a webinar and send me an email six months later, and I've had people that I've worked with for years. Um, it's all over the board, honestly. I got it. But I will tell you this. Um, I have... Lots and lots and lots and lots. Of, I mean, I wouldn't be sitting here today. I never intended to be doing this. I intended to just be trading, um, maybe becoming a full-time psychoanalyst because I thought it found it so fascinating. But I didn't. I certainly didn't intend to be doing this. 
But what happened was when I started talking about it, so many people started saying it helped them, it worked, it made sense in a different way. And um, one client, he has my favorite statement, when I do what you say, I make money, and when I don't do what you say, I don't make money. And I don't mean that about what Denise says. You know, when when I follow this method, I make money. When I don't follow this method, I don't make money. Um, but it depends on what, you know, it depends on where your what your starting point is, how emotionally aware you are to begin with, um, how cognitive you are to begin with, how impulsive you are to begin with, um, or not. Um, but I also, I know this, and I said this to the hedge fund guy yesterday, everybody can um, reduce their bad trades through getting enough sleep, walking away, and, and recognizing simply not trading when they're angry. And it, as you start to reduce the number of bad trades, or, you know, but I know better, wish I wouldn't have taken that trade, what was I thinking? If you just extract those from your P&L, think about the fallout, or the, po- the positive fallout from that. You're not debited cash capital-wise, you're not as psychologically debited, and then you're more set up to make a, a better trade the next time. If you just extract the bottom 10 to 20 percent that are made out of tiredness, irritation, frustration over the last trade, fear of missing out. Uh, you know. So you look at it sort of from how do I reduce the worst of what I do? And then that has to have an effect, you know, a total overall effect. But, you know, you could you could sort of get it in months or it might take years. I, I don't have an exact answer. <laughs> Sorry. But that's the truth. All right. And as I've mentioned, we had so many more great questions. And, Denise, I'll promise this, and I'll make sure that this is okay, but Denise will get back to you. We'll provide her with uh, your <laughs> questions and your email. <laughs> Not that many more. <laughs> yeah. If I get sent 400 questions, you have to give me a lot of time. I might say buy the book. No, no. I mean, I, I, I do try to answer. I mean, to the extent that I can answer simple questions by email, I do try to do it. Okay. Um, and uh, also, I want to give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about, about your book, Market Mind Games, which will be coming out in the fall. And if we flip to the last side, slide, we'll be able to see uh, your website address as well. Oh, okay. Do, do, do. Clipping. Okay. There you see the Rethink Group, which is the parent company, actually, of Trader Psyches. And you can start at the Rethink Group, but as traders, you're going to want to click right through to Trader Psyches. Uh, So there's also TraderPsyches.com, or you can just Google me and you'll find TraderPsyches.com. Um, By the way, there's a blog on Trader Psyches called Psychological Capital that's got a lot of good stuff on it, some of it funny. Um, There's also a place to sign up for newsletter. There is the book on the homepage of TraderPsyches.com. The Rethink Group, just so everybody understands, I mean, we have a division that works with traders. We now have a division that works with athletes also. Um, And the Rethink Group kind of does the corporate work. Uh, The book will be out... uh, According to McGraw-Hill yesterday, uh, the date's now December 9th, but it'll probably move up from that. And, you know, if I had my druthers about it, it, it would be a totally psychological take on markets and dealing with them. That would be the subtitle, but I won't get my subtitle. <laughs> uh, it'll be the very expanded version of what we just talked about. Um, a lot about regret theory and how regret plays into this is standard classical decision making. A lot about this fractal piece, a lot about emotions as data, um, a few other funky, quirky things, um, some exercises to do to actually understand yourself. And um, like I said, if all goes well, it'll be out before December 9th. <laughs> Excellent. So, we do have, I will say one more thing. Um, we do have a series of e-learning courses, which you'll find through that Trader Psyches website, um, if anyone wants to take a look at those. Um, and sometimes it, some of them involve monthly group coaching. 
et cetera. I just encourage you to look around both the Rethink Group and Trader Psyches and see what you find. Sign up for the newsletter, look at the blog, and try to rethink thinking altogether is the net, net, net of it. Look at those emotions and feelings in a completely different way. All right. Thank you so much, Denise. Um, Thank you. I had a great time, and I hope everyone else had as much fun as we did today. Uh, we will have the recorded version of the webinar available no later than early next week on news.cqg.com. And I just want to thank you all again for joining us. Great. Thank you. All right. Good night, everyone.